Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm trailing after eight hours of uh, some pretty intense discussion uh, today, so I'm going to do my best to keep the energy up uh, for the last session of the afternoon. I'm um, already appreciative that we filled this room up in terms of seating capacity, so thank you so much. Um, is that too loud? No? A little bit? Let's just turn it down a little bit. Is that a little bit better? Yeah? Okay, awesome. Um, so my name is Scott Wallace and I um, am an environmental scientist and currently studying law at Griffith University. My background in terms of involvement um, with the animal rights and activist movement um, really kicked off when I was studying my undergrad at Griffith University. When I started volunteering with a group called Sea Shepherd, uh, Direct Action Marine Conservation Group. So I've been a part of Sea Shepherd um, as a volunteer for about seven years now and I recently was involved uh, in Operation Reef Defence as the campaign leader aboard the Steve Irwin for about a month. And what I want to do today um, is essentially give you a bit of a shotgun of information, a whole bunch of different perspectives, some factual content, and also some of the more theoretical content um, with, with, with the aim to um, cover a bit of the science, a bit of the animal agriculture stuff, a bit of the law, and some of the behavioural change and education side of things. Um, I have worked for a university in Queensland for about four years now as an educator, focusing on um, you know, the natural environment, scientists, biology, ecology, and that sort of stuff. So, um, I think people are here to, to get a different perspective, to find out you know, more tips, uh, tricks in terms of advocacy and how can we do a better job. And why? Give it a second, my finger comes to it. Gonna fiddle around with a little, what's your mind? It's probably the, Yes. Awesome. Um, and so one thing that I really want to focus on is getting some, some framing or context to the work that we're all doing. We often have a lot of questions like, why is this happening? Why is this organization not doing this? Um, you know, why are people still consuming and supporting the system? Well, hopefully I can share some of my opinions um, to have some of those answered, at least in some way, in terms of how I see them. And so my title for today was Towards Earth-Centered Culture, Understanding the System. And so what I really think we need to be focusing on is looking at the entire system, not just on people's consumption. We want to shift to a, a culture where the, the laws are different, the people's choices are different, the way we interact and relate with the natural world is different. Um, and one that is inclusive and, cons and considerate of the non-human members of the Earth community, um, which is what we're here to, today to, to speak on their behalf. And so this picture for me illustrates so many things. It has me reflecting, has me really going into myself, thinking about, okay, we have two uh, opposing uh, worldviews here. We have the ego and the eco, right? Getting a bit more technical, we have the anthropocentric, the human-centered worldview on the left-hand side. Um, why is it not coming up right? That'll be okay. And then we have the eco-centric, or the earth-centered worldview on the right-hand side. And over here on the left, we can see that there's a clear hierarchy, firstly with um, the, with men and male, a male figure on the top, and then beneath them we have these different layers uh, illustrating the importance or the value of these different creatures. And so we can see, um, you know, for example, we have the cute, cuddly, charismatic megafauna, you know, the whales, the dolphins, the tigers, these creatures, people are like, oh, really, really cute, they're really important and valuable, those exotic creatures. And we start moving down towards, um, you know, the we have our domestic uh, animals, then the food animals, and then the, the smaller uh, life forms and pests and then things that we don't really see. Um, and so this human-centered worldview um, and way of looking at things has really dominated our entire culture, has really dominated our governance, our law, policies, everything we eat, everything we consume, even the words we use. For example, I own a dog. I own signifies that this is a property that I am uh, have extending my ownership over. And so even things like that, I still struggle at, at the moment to stop referring to, oh, that's his owner. It's like, no, 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 this is a someone, not a something. You know, uh, it's not an object, it's a subject. And so this human world, uh, human-centered world worldview is, has really been operating on the underside of all of our, all of our uh, societies. Um, and it's really it's so deeply entrenched within our society and our culture that we don't even realize that this is what's underlying a lot of the environmental harms and the disconnect that we have um, as humans to this planet and ourselves. And so 
picking apart this uh, human-centered worldview, we do see that human superiority. We do see these arbitrary hierarchies and speciesism present where we are discriminating against particular uh, uh, animals based off their um, membership to a particular species. And so this is something that for me, why is that not happening? Does anyone know a quick solution to fix that? Anyway, um, so something for me which has really enforced this was studying environmental science, looking at the, the conservation status or the value of a particular creature. We didn't talk about generally the life for these animals to exist and thrive. It was this is an animal, this is its classification based off the numbers left in the environment which we have decimated, therefore it has this status. It's then worthy of more protection, more concern, some would say more moral significance than other animals. So I've experienced this firsthand and started to question these things after, through my studies um, and coming out the other side. So we have non-human animals as property. This is one of the most profound things. If we can shift that um, in terms of animals, then we are seriously moving in the right direction. <coughs> as I said, these, this, uh, this, this worldview, these beliefs and ideologies have been institutionalized. They are everywhere and more than we realize. Um, and so what we have, we have this human centeredness and this is a, a illustration taken off Dr. Melanie Joy's TED talk on carnism, um, why we um, eat particular animals. And so this human-centered worldview has uh, persevered within our educational institutions. We heard this morning from Sarah from Voiceless that the animal ag industry um, have particular content they are feeding into schools to, in order to increase consumption of animal products. So they're influencing so much more than we realise. Obviously, we have the law, which I'm going to touch about, um, and I believe the law upholds and maintains these systems of exploitation that we are so uh, passionate about fighting against and really shining a light on. Um, again, religion, we have the old archaic beliefs that humans have dominion over all members of the earth community. Um, this stuff needs to be challenged. Finance, government, you name it, it's all uh, have, have had this human-centred worldview. And as a result of this human-centered worldview, this is what we are seeing. Uh, we are seeing the systemic, normalized exploitation of billions of billions of creatures each year. This is just land animals. This is excluding the 2.7 trillion fishes that are killed each year. These are the lives that are being lost, right? And so this is kept out of mind, out of sight from the consumer. Um, which is one of the important things we need, to, we need to address is the disconnection between our choices and our consequences and the effect that has on the animals and the environment. And so, well, the animal agriculture industry um, is having a massive effect on the environment. I cannot stress this enough. Um, the animal agriculture sector is an absolute ecological disaster. Now the crazy thing is I've come through four years of environmental science at a university which had the first environmental course in the state, if not Australia, and the information about animal agriculture wasn't provided to me. So scientists are coming through four years, three, four years of conservation, environmental sustainability, and not knowing how destructive this industry is. You can guess I was freaking pissed off when I realised the effects of this industry. So in Australia, 56% of our total land is just used for grazing. I knew things were bad, I didn't realise how bad. And this is something that, for example, the documentary um, Cowspiracy really blew the lid for me uh, in terms of the effect of animal ag on the, on the environment. Do you mean usable lands or do you mean all Total the land. So there'll be other portions of land within Australia that won't be good for agriculture, but 56% of our total land just used for grazing. Um, whereas, you know, 3 or 4% of our total land in Australia is used to grow all the plant foods for human consumption. Um, and so WWF estimated that land clearing in Queensland kills about 34 million native mammals, birds and reptiles each year. Insane. Um, so this is a Queensland example. So we've heard so much, at least where I'm from, um, that we have an absolute deforestation crisis at the moment, land clearing crisis. And Australia is one of the only countries in the OECD, which is the 20 whatever most developed countries, that is a hotspot for clearing. Now, we often hear people talking about how destructive the mining sector is, and you know, the cities are growing and it's destroying habitat and animals are dying. Um, I looked into the data, because that's what you need to do, is go and find out the deeper story behind the numbers. Numbers don't mean much until you can get someone to understand what the hell that means. 
So about 400,000 hectares of land was cleared during uh, 2015 to 2016 in Queensland. Um, the mining sector accounted for 0.75 of a percent of land clearing. Infrastructure accounted for 0.5% of land clearing and settlements in terms of uh, the cities and rural areas that are growing, 0.25%. 93.4% of all the land cleared during that year was for, animal, for livestock. Um, so this leaves animal agriculture of the, as a leading cause of habitat destruction, um, clearly in Australia and in many, many places around the world. Um, and globally, this is what's occupying so much land. It's this stuff that really isn't discussed, hasn't been presented to me as a scientist, and so this is one of the motivators for me to do my advocacy, um, is to get the messages out there, share them with people, because we deserve nothing less. I would, would have wanted to know this information, firstly when I was a kid, and understand my choices have an effect on animals, but also being an environmentalist, consuming animal products, not realising the effect that was having on the environment. I was, uh, for 23 years, consuming animal products, um, and then started looking into my footprint, decided to go, okay, I'm going to stop um, supporting particular um, animal product industries, but in the end, uh, realising the effect that my diet was having was really, really concerning. Um, three months in Australia, it would be an absolute injustice to not talk about the effect of animal ag on the animals. This is what we're here for. Um, personally, I think the animals form one picture of the broader environment. Um, and I'm sort of taking a holistic approach in some senses, but obviously narrowing it down for the animals. Three months in Australia. This is straight off the Australian Bureau of Statistics website. They update this every few months. You can see the kill count for how many lives are lost in Australia. It's around 170 million in three months. Yesterday while I was doing the Cuba Truth in Pitt Street, um, sharing this information with, uh, with one of the fellows, he was saying, in three months, is that how much we eat? I said, exactly, bro. Exactly. It is just you and your burger on that one day. There's another however many billion people doing the same thing. Um, and uh, most of us would know that the, the dairy industry is extremely cruel in terms of the, the forced impregnation of the, um, the mothers, the, the kidnapping of the calves, and then the slaughtering of the calves as well if they're a male because they are a byproduct, a waste product. They don't make money, essentially. Um, so save lives, go vegan. This is a little infographic that I made up just to get people to connect to um, the effects of our choices. We purchase meat, eggs and dairy, animals die. Very, very simple. And I didn't realise this for most of my life, which is, as most people haven't realised, we've been disconnected from our choices. Are the stats for fish also on the ABS website? You'll struggle to find that. Um, it's really quite difficult to find uh, the amount of uh, fish that are being caught. Um, in Queensland, from what I've heard from the leading scientists, recreational fishermen catch more than all the commercial fishermen combined. And the similar thing in New South Wales. So it was just me and my dad fishing you know, every weekend, but that totals up. And when 700,000 people in the state of Queensland consider themselves fishermen, this is what's happening. It's the collective impact of cumulative actions that is really ruining things, and we need to take responsibility as individuals. So um, in terms of environmental footprint, um, we are seeing that animal ag is an absolute ecological disaster. Um, the leading driver you know, of uh, species loss, ocean dead zones, massive uh, footprint in terms of land use, water use. Um, climate change is a tricky one because there's so much mixed data out there, and myself as a scientist trying to sift through what's accurate has been so tricky in terms of finding this information for an Australian context and let alone an unbiased one from either side. Um, but I have, I'm fairly confident and I can't pick the exact number, um, but we're looking at one of the absolute leading drivers of climate change in terms of livestock and their contributions to um, climate change. I've attended so many climate change conferences over the years with the leading experts from this university in that country um, and climate change is you know, a massive thing that needs a lot of attention. However, at these events, uh, climate change is always synonymous with fossil fuels, renewable energy, nothing about consumption and diets. So we are seeing like institutionalised suppression of information. We are seeing the same rhetoric over and over and over. How do we cut down uh, you know, our contributions to fossil fuels? Well, geez, you know, tell the governments to do this, tell industry to do that. Um, uh, diet needs to be one on the agenda. We are naive to think we cannot tackle um, uh, climate change without addressing our diets and consumption, which is, I'm glad to see, um, even the last 
few weeks, a lot more reports coming out um, about the effect of animal ag, um, mainly on the environment. Um, and this is, the animal agriculture sector is where overwhelmingly 90 odd percent of the animals that we are using go to. And so that's one thing that if I can approach this from an environmental perspective, um, which has been my main focus, my main in, and then obviously intertwined uh, issues of diet and consumption and veganism and animal rights as part of that, I found it to be quite, um, quite powerful. So what's being done about the animal egg sector? Um, well, not a lot, to be honest, uh, which is extremely concerning. I've seen Greenpeace uh, about a few months ago start their, their new initiative, which is less is more, which was great because they're saying less meat consumption is, is better, right? And they're being much more clear about the effects of animal ag on the environment and then on the animals. Um, but we are seeing um, these organisations, and not only these, but it's in a whole bunch. I'm using a, some of the most prevalent ones in Australia to illustrate that. Um, if you jump on their website and try to find things about animal ag and farming, you'll struggle to find a lot of information. Now, as an environmental scientist, I would expect the leading organisations to be sharing this information and empowering the public with facts and statistics to understand what are the consequences of their choices. The reason why all the land's being cleared, the reason why the animals are dying is because of our habits, we are choosing these products, we must take responsibility for the effects of that, right? Um, my theory as to why, uh, and so I did, a, I did an essay a few years ago analyzing the databases of these organizations to find animal ag, veganism, plant-based diets, all of this, and climate change. You type in climate change, so many things come up, right? Renewables, fossil fuels, um, all that. You do a search for animal ag and veganism on their databases and you get this much, this much. And that's, that's objectively, that's the facts about what information they are presenting. And so we don't have uh, the environmental scientists being equipped with understanding of the animal ag sector. We don't have the leading environmental organisations uh, giving the public information about the animal ag sector. It's no, uh, it's no surprise that the public aren't aware of what's happening. Is, sorry, is that because it's been deliberately suppressed? Is, does that data exist? Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, so I really think that the issue why they are not addressing it is the solution. Right. Might sound funny. How do we tackle an industry which is uh, polluting the planet? Solutions. We need to change our consumption. We need to change our habits. Because as long as we keep supporting these industries, obviously they're going to continue. We all know this, we're aware of this. But it's about in, uh, empowering people to understand that and know that we need to take responsibility for the effects on the animals, the effects on the planet that our choices are having. And it's becoming very, very clear. If you want to minimize your ecological footprint, the quickest, cheapest, most effective way to do that is to minimize, um, to cut out animal products completely and go vegan on a whole foods, plant-based diet. Simple as that. I, when I was doing my, my research and my, my studies, I just kept denying that and not really giving it much thought and just a little voice in the back of my head, now shh, I still want to eat meat. I'm an environmentalist, but I still want to eat meat. I'm a marine conservationist, but I still want to slaughter fish because they taste good, you know? So I've gone through my own transformation of culture as an individual, which is what I think everyone needs to be doing. We've all gone through that at some point. It's an ongoing, you know, this never-ending process. And so the, the cultural aspect of, um, uh, you know, the animal rights movement and our consumption and ecological sustainability, um, how we see the natural world and what we eat and what we consume obviously forms a massive part of that. Um, now these organisations are dependent on a lot of funding and so if they are telling people this is the sector, if you want to address it, you need to go vegan, then people might get their backs up, they might be a bit more resistant to, resistant to change because it's going to challenge them in a fairly big way. It's much easier for me to sign a petition to stop mining and show my dissent against the fossil fuel sector than it was to change my diet because that's something I actually need to do. So it's all about taking responsibility, right? Um, and if they can keep funding coming through um, and keep people feeling cushy, and yes, you've donated to this, and we've had a win, tap on the back, keep donating, then why would they change what they do? Why would they change the recipe if they're still getting funding? I'm not knocking their, their efforts. I'm saying they have, you know, these big organisations have had a massively, profoundly positive effect in terms of environmental campaigns, massive. But this one needs to be addressed, like absolutely paramount. Um, and so, again, looking into the solutions, why is the adoption of a plant-based diet something that's so challenging? 
In an ideal world, I would come to you, I'll be doing a presentation and say, guys, animal agriculture industry is destroying the planet, it's harming the animals. In order to change this, you need to change your diet. And this is what veganism is about, you know, as, uh, as a philosophy, because it's not just about a diet. And this is how the diet aspect falls into that. People go, Scott, thanks so much, dude. I didn't know I'm going to go vegan. Cheers. That's an ideal world. We don't live like that, though. We have our barriers. We have our resistance. We have our conditioning. We have the things we've been told for decades and decades and decades and decades. That's what we're, that's what we're up against, right? So... As part of that human-centered, anthropocentric worldviews, they've really influenced our choices in terms of what we consume, what we eat. And we have carnism. If you haven't heard about Dr. Melanie Joy, please check out her research. She did her PhD for about four or five years on the psychology of eating meat. Just that. She got pretty deep, right? She got into her own mind. She got into everyone's mind <laughs> and really figured out why are we doing this? Um, and kindism is what she uh, established is this invisible belief system or ideology that conditions us to eat certain animals. Um, because in our culture, or Australian culture, we choose to you know, eat and consume pigs, chickens, ducks, um, what else, you know? Whereas the Southeast Asian, some of the populations over there will gladly eat their dog, their dogs. Japanese consuming their whale flesh. So. In our little pockets in the world, we have been exposed to uh, you know, advertising and marketing that has convinced us that this is what we need to eat. This is part of Australian culture. On the 26th of January, we kill and slaughter baby lambs and eat their flesh. That's our culture. I don't think that's a healthy culture. How can that be a healthy culture? We are living in a state where the consumption of these products, products, you know, even our, our terminology in words um, really illustrates to us um, how we view non-human animals. So this is me, I don't know how many years ago, but this is probably midway during my um, science degree when I was understanding, you know, the importance of ecology and fish and marine life and I was volunteering for Sea Shepherd and on the weekend I was fishing, right? I thought I was in alignment because I was studying this stuff and I knew the fish stocks and I knew that killing this little fish is all good and it's just my little footprint and it's all chill. Um, this is the, the cognitive dissonance that we are experiencing. So we have these conflicting, um, uh, I forgot the technical terms, but essentially we have one uh, belief or thought, which is for me, I'm an environmental scientist, uh, I'm a marine conservationist and I love the ocean and I want to protect it with my life. The other thought is, I'm eating sea life, I'm paying people to slaughter sea life, that doesn't match up. And so we've all experienced that cognitive dissonance in for a whole bunch of things. It's not just something specifically associated to our consumption and interaction with animals. Um, there's so much dissonance going on. But uh, for me, this was one of those uh, issues that I really needed to reconcile. How can I be an environmentalist? How can I love animals and uh, still do this? So as part of my um, uh, story that I share with people during my outreach, I've spoken to a few schools now um, and getting into the education system, sharing these things with students, uh, you know, conferences, universities, getting the message out there, but in some ways also putting my neck out on the line saying, I thought these things, I was acting like this, I've reconsidered it and we can all do that. We can all do that and empower and educate people and not shame and blame them. Um, I heard James Aspie saying a few years ago, inform and explain, not shame and blame. For me, that's a very powerful tool in terms of advocacy. Um, a tricky thing is there's very few vegans within the environmental science movement and conservation movement. Um, we weren't taught what was going on. We don't hear it from the leading environmental organizations. Um, so this, I'm just gonna have a bit of water. <laughs> so back to this human centeredness, back to how we interact in, uh, with the natural world and the role that the law has in that. So, Firstly, just because something is legal doesn't make it morally acceptable. Simple as that. It's, you know, it's an intuitive thing that we know. Just because this is happening and it's legal, we need to question everything. Everything. Um, and so, under this, uh, because animals are considered property under our Western legal system, they are considered an object you know, for the purposes of the Sales, Sales of Goods Act, um, for Australian Consumer Law, animals are all considered 
property they're subject to you know being commodified and this property status of animals is something that really underpins their exploitation and continued exploitation um, because they have a price on their head there is something um, they're an object and so from that property status we move into okay well animals are property they're for us to be used and we want to keep these systems of exploitation going so well we want people to also continue to purchase our, our products um, and therefore we need to be appealing to people's consciences in terms of how the animals are treated. Now we're operating on the welfare model, the welfareist paradigm, and there's a massive distinction between animal rights and animal welfare. Now people have their opinions in terms of the incrementalist approach to advocating for animal rights, um, whether they advocate for you know moving from cage free to um, or cage to cage free. I'm an abolitionist, I believe that we need to be taking assertive action to abolish the property status of animals and all forms of animal exploitation. Um, some people can, can do that very quickly in terms of their choices. Some other people take a different route. However, this welfare is paradigm. We can see here it's the five, the five Fs. Um, and so we have the freedom from hunger or thirst, discomfort, pain, injury, disease, normal behavior, fear and stress. What's a right that's not listed on this list? A right to life, exactly, and up to life, and so under our under our systems, under our, our current systems of governance and you know law and policy, we don't grant animals a right to life. We grant them uh, a right to be used and exploited in a humane manner and subject to being property. Uh, if you haven't checked out Dominion, uh, you can check it out and really see that the animals in the animal egg sector are not being granted even these rights a lot of the time. And so just highlighting that um, the difference between the rights and the welfare paradigm, the welfare paradigm is the dominant paradigm that underpins our current legal system. So the law isn't concerned about animal rights, it's concerned about <coughs> regulating our use and exploitation of animals. So I'm just gonna go through, um, please bear with me for these few slides, I'm just gonna go through some of the legislation from Queensland. Um, and just check out the legislation in your own time, have a read, and it does get a bit um, intuitive at times, but a lot of it's so confusing. Uh, I didn't start studying law to become a lawyer. I wanted to understand how these things operate. How does our system work? And I don't want to be restricted in terms of my action because I don't understand what's going on or what I can and can't do. I want to be empowered. So the purposes of this act, this is the Animal Care and Protection Act in Queensland. I've highlighted there, this is the purpose of this act, is to do the following. A, the first purpose, promote the responsible care and use of animals. That's the first purpose of our leading uh, animal protection legislation, is to promote the use of animals. So how is that ever, ever going to be, you know, considering the rights of animals and their life, if this law is to uphold these systems of exploitation? It's written there, black and white. Again, based off that welfareist paradigm. And to achieve a reasonable balance between the welfare of animals and the interests of persons whose livelihood is dependent on the animals. So it's, it seems very fair. We balance the interests of animals with people who exploit them and use them. Whose voice is going to be louder? The animals or the people whose livelihoods are dependent on them. Again, back to this human-centered worldview, it's the, the interests um, of the industry um, who are going to be outweighed, uh, so we're going to outweigh the voice of the animals. Now, 3C says to protect animals from unjustifiable, unnecessary, and un or unreasonable pain. That looks great. That looks great. Unjustifiable, unnecessary, unreasonable pain. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, this act is just looking after the animals left, right, and center. Um, I thought it was, and we, we know that uh, what happens in the animal farming sector is far from... Um, uh, you know, cushy and comfortable and nice. Um, so there's provisions here for animal cruelty. So it says a person must not be cruel to an animal. And the maximum penalty for this offence is $261,000. When have we ever, ever heard of someone being charged for a cruelty offence and they've been given the maximum penalty? Ever. If you have, please let me know, because that's rare. Uh, you know, we often receive...